talk about when you were in the Coast Guard, and your nickname was Hollywood. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got that nickname, and what it is about films that you like so much? Well, when I was in the Coast Guard, they called me Hollywood because I was a kid that loved going to the movies. I mean, when a lot of the guys, I was 15 and a half years old when I was in the Coast Guard for one year, and they discharged me for being underage. <clears throat> but all my buddies at the base would say, let's go here, let's go there. And I'd go, ah, I wanted to go to the movies. So I'd hitchhike up to Hollywood, and I'd go to any movie that was playing, and I saw them all. So that's why they called me Hollywood. And I used to relate stories, oh, I saw such and such a person here, I saw this person there you know, this star, and uh, it impressed me. I loved it, particularly since I had such a very different life. I mean, God, growing up as a kid, it was very tough. And one of the stars I think I've read that was your idol was Lana Turner. <laughs> I loved Lana Turner. I had many stars. I liked them all. I like, of course, the ones that everyone knows, you know, like um, Tyrone Power, Lana Turner, Linda Darnell, Rita Hayworth. But I also loved the... Evelyn Keys, the, you know, um, Lorraine Day, Peter Lorre. I mean, I like them all. But Lana Turner, I, I just thought she was so incredible. I mean, such an incredible beauty. And I remember when she did The Postman Always Rings twice. I mean, it just blew me away, uh, as well as many other films. But when I first met her was on a film called The Sea Chase. It was my first film under contract to Warner Brothers. And Lana came on board a ship. We were shooting in Hawaii. And she laid across my lap, and I didn't know what to do with my hands. And one of the guys said, oh, Lana, this is Tab Hunter. He's been dying to meet you, as you can tell by his attitude all morning. And I looked at her, and I said, you know, I've been a fan of yours since I was a kid. <laughs> and I felt like I... <laughs> when you were a kid, or even when you were in the Coast Guard, and you saw these movies, did you ever realize that you would be up there, that you'd be a big movie star, and people that were 15 were watching you on the screen. It's interesting because I always knew I was going to be in films. How or why, I don't know. Now, many, many people probably feel the same thing, but it just sort of happened. It just sort of, I just fell into all of that. And that's difficult because you're not prepared for it. I wasn't prepared for the work, so you've got to learn your craft uh, while you're getting these jobs. And that's much more difficult than if you really had a chance to study uh, right from the beginning. Once I got under contract to Warner Brothers, I was thrilled about the contract, but then the first film really turned me off because it was just a nothing part. It was just, yes sir, no sir, aye aye sir. And here I had already had tremendous amounts of publicity by the American public. I had been voted by the Audience Award as the most popular newcomer and this and that. And I had done quite a few independent films at that point. And by this time, I was really getting serious. Uh, I had already done Battle Cry and I wasn't under contract. And I already worked for Bill Wellman and Track of the Cat. So I really now was focused on becoming a fine actor. And it was very difficult um, when the studio wasn't giving me um, anything to do. So I loved the studio. I loved being a part of it. And I knew their publicity buildup and all that was great. All of that is fantastic. But what about the product? You know, where can I get out and, you know, sink my teeth into a good role? And luckily, Warners did loan me out uh, to a lot of live television in those days. And uh, also independent, I mean, uh, studio films, loan outs, because there just wasn't that much happening at the studio. It was the end of the studio system. So I thank God that uh, Jack Warner loaned me when he, when he was able to and when he wasn't mad at me and I wasn't on suspension. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about Jack Warner? What was he like as his boss, as a man? Are there any stories that you have with Jack about Jack Warner? Jack Warner to me was like a, a, a Lucifer. He had this kind of look about him with his little pencil mustache. You know, fat-faced Adolf Manjou. Uh, he was... Um, he was the boss. He knew exactly what he wanted. And that was important. I had some good dealings with him. I had some bad dealings with him. But mainly I dealt with his right-hand man, who was Steve Trilling, who was a gem. And I really got along really well with, with Steve. However, I do have a wonderful story on Warner. <clears throat> One time I had just won an award as the most popular newcomer and God knows what. And Warner's won everything that year. They won the Peggy Lee won award. I won the award. Films won the award. Everything happened. And all the press from all around the world were there photographing us. And 
One guy said, smile pretty, Tab. This is for the next issue of Confidential Magazine. And I said, oh, God. And I threw up my hands and turned my back, and Jack Warner put his arm around me and pulled me back and said, come back here. He said, just remember this. Today's headlines, tomorrow's toilet paper. <laughs> I said, whoa, I will remember that. And within a year, I was the top star at Warner Brothers. It was amazing. And, the, and I just understood this. You shot Battle Cry before you shot Track the Cat. <clears throat> yes, I was freelance actor, and I'd heard about the role through Merv Griffin. Merv Griffin told me about Battle Cry. I did a lot of tests for Battle Cry, many tests. I did another picture. Uh, Bill Wellman saw rushes from Battle Cry and said, I want this kid for my next film, Track of the Cat. And that's when Warner's thought, well, we have an option on him. He's done two pictures for us. Why don't we exercise the option and put him under contract? So they put me under contract. My first film was Sea Chase with John Wayne and Lana Turner. Okay, but back up a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you. I want you to talk about your name, how you got the name Tab Hunter. The name Tab Hunter is a product of Hollywood from Henry Wilson and my agent Dick Clayton at the time. They said, we've got to tab you something. And I showed hunters and jumpers. I'm, I'm a big horse lover. And so it became Tab Hunter as opposed to Tab Jumper. But my real name is Art Galeen. And uh, no one ever called me Arthur except my mother. I hated that. And no one ever called me Art uh, that never knew me as Art. I didn't like that because I thought they were coming into a part of my life that did not, it was not, a, uh, there was no business of theirs. And what did you think of the name Tab Hunter? Do you like it now, even looking back? Now, are you, do, do you like your name? Are you happy with the choice? When I think of the name Tab Hunter now, I accept that I've had it for so many years, of course, I'm paid to the order of Tab Hunter that always looks nice on a check. But uh, when I first, was given the name Tab Hunter. I thought, Tab Hunter, it sounds like something in a pair of diapers going, hi, hey, my name is Tab Hunter. And I really didn't think too much of that. <laughs> no, I didn't at all, until, until I all of a sudden started getting a little bit of respect for it. But how do you get respect for the name like Tab? You know, I only wish I'd registered the name when the drink came out. And one of the things you talk about a lot is you were a product of Hollywood. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that means and what it means to you? Well, to me, uh, I always, I referred to myself as a product of Hollywood. I referred to myself as a product of Hollywood because I really was sent out on interviews and with no experience. My interests were with my horses and with my figure skating at the time. And Hollywood was there, and if I would become a part of it, fine. And once a few jobs started coming along at the beginning, I was a product of Hollywood. I was manufactured. And then when Island of Desire came along, uh, this press went totally insane. And I was very, very popular, but I wasn't working. And I felt a lot of it had to do with the fact that I hadn't had the experience. So I considered myself a product of Hollywood. And it really tore at me quite a bit, actually, you know, at the beginning. Well, I know that MGM, the studio MGM, did a lot of training for, for people that were on contract with them. You know, they had singing and voice lessons and all these different kinds of lessons. Did you have that at Warner Brothers as well? MGM, I think, was fabulous for, for the young people under contract. Singing, dancing, you name it all. At Warner Brothers, I had certain things. For example, uh, I had a coach there that I loved, Joe Graham. He was wonderful. And a couple of other coaches were there at different times. Uh, I worked with um, uh, a well-known boxer at that time, Mushy Callahan, getting in preparation for a film. You'd work with specific people for specific things, how to, to draw a gun quickly, you know, work with a professional at that, how to do this, how to do that. When it came to the horse stuff for Westerns, I did all my own stuff because I had my own horses. In fact, I even rented the studio my own horse. You know, she became a movie star and never got a Patsy Award. <laughs> What movie? Did you make a movie? Yes, I used Swizz in. Uh, she was a show jumper that I bought from Dan Daly's wife, and uh, she was kind of weird. So I threw a western saddle on her. I put a sock saddle on her and showed, uh, used her in. Oh gosh, The Burning Hills with Natalie Wood, uh, Gunman's Walk with Van Heflin. I used her again in. Uh, they came to Cordura with Gary Cooper, Rita Hayworth, and Van Heflin. Uh, so she was a real movie star <laughs> and never got a patsy. <laughs> Being labeled a heartthrob or a this or a that is a label that, that the press and people like to stick on people. And uh, I have really been uncomfortable all my life with labels. 
and I was extremely uncomfortable with all of that. I never felt at ease. Uh, it was a wonderful part of it, and it had to be to continue on. You know, it just was one of those things, but I didn't know how to handle it, and I was not comfortable with it. But uh, it was like a hot fudge sundae, and I call those things the hot fudge sundaes of life. I love a good hot fudge sundae, but you just can't live on that alone. You better have the, the protein and the important things. When almost, it's like too much of it can also make you sick. You know, too much, you're like, yeah, uh. <laughs> Too much of that can make you sick mentally, physically, and most important, spiritually. Um, now we're going to go, we talked a little bit about Island of Desire, and you talked about Linda Darnell. I'm just going to have you talk a little bit more about that film and a little bit more of working with her. She was so beautiful, and you said she was sort of an idol of yours, too, along with Lana Turner. Can you talk a little bit about making that film? You know, if you have any stories you have about making the film and with Linda. Well, Linda Darnell was an amazing beauty, and <clears throat> I was brought in to test for the role uh, of Chicken Dugan in Island of Desire, and Linda was there for the test. And I'll never forget, the, in the, there was a, we were doing this love scene at, at Goldwyn Studios, and I had to take her in my arms and kiss her, and I started shaking, because she I didn't uh, hear it was a movie star in my arms, and she said, just relax, and she pinched me, and she said, I'm good luck for newcomers. And then we did the scene, and I kissed her, and after the service, she said, that was nice. And she pinched me again. And I thought, I've just kissed the Blessed Mother from uh, the song of Bernadette. <laughs> oh, she was terrific. I loved her. You know, the films like Blood and Sand with Jerome Power, you know, Letter to the Three Wives. I was a big, big Linda fan. So it was a great opportunity and a great experience working with her. Uh, and she was so helpful, extremely helpful. Can you go into that a little bit deeper? How is she helpful to you? In scenes uh, with Linda, she would she would help me relax. You know, she would just she would make me forget everything around and just concentrate on her and what was happening in the moment with us, which was really wonderful because I had no idea where we were, what we were doing. It was just the it was very difficult, and I was very bad in that film. And my first review said, Tab Hunter may be all right for the physical type, but is quite inadequate as an actor. And I thought, I've got to set out to do something about that. Battle For Battle Cry, I tested seven times for the role. I made seven different screen tests. The Warners weren't quite sure who they wanted uh, for the role that I eventually got. They tested Jimmy Dean, they tested Paul Newman, they tested, oh, God, I don't know how many people. They went back to New York, tested actors back there. Then they, they te oh, tested lots of different women uh, for the roles. I tested with five or six different women for the role that Dorothy Malone finally got of the married woman. Uh, finally, after all the tests, I just said, that's enough. They must know what they want. And they came back from New York, having test tested Jimmy at Kazan's. Uh, uh, Kazan said, I've got a boy here that we don't want you to say anything about, but he's really wonderful. Keep it quiet. They tested Jimmy. They brought him out. Uh, they didn't bring him up, but they, they came back to California. And they said, well, we'll try one more with you. So they tested me with Aldo Ray and James Whitmore, and uh, I thought I was so bad in the test, I went home and just complained, and oh, I was really upset. That was the test that got me the role. That was the final one. So you never know. Everyone really needs the outside eye to help them. You're probably just trying to say is that Elaine like, Kazan had the actor studio. Because you're looking for a word, the actor studio with James Dean. Well, Jimmy was, uh, you know, I respected Jimmy and I knew Jimmy in the lot because he used to come over when I was doing Battle Cry and he'd sit on my dressing room steps and we'd sit and talk. And he was, he was doing uh, East of Eden. And I just admired people who were, who'd had a theater background or a, a proper training. But to learn while you're on the set, or to learn, you know, it's much harder, you know, just learning while doing. But you learn, if anything, what not to do again next time. You just said that out of desire, you didn't feel you were very good. How do you feel about Battle Cry when you watch it? Or do you watch your old films now? You know, what do you think of your role in Battle Cry? I never watch my old films. I don't like to. It makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, so I just avoid them. Uh, the Battle Cry role, I know it was a pretty good, uh, I did a pretty good job. I took pages and pages of notes 
Uh, I read the book, underlined anything that had to do with the character in the slightest, in any way. Uh, and I was right, I was ready for that role. That picture was the breakout picture for me that made me a movie star at uh, Warner Brothers, even though I wasn't under contract at that time. Well, in the scene too, I think that when you took off your shirt, you know, I think you're, um, was it Dorothy Malone that you were with and you take off your shirt? I can't remember if it's a spill on it or something like that. And I'm like, okay, there's where the fan letters started coming. Well, <clears throat> I had already received, th I used to receive thousands of fan letters a week when I wasn't doing a lot of films. I had just done a few little, little inconsequential films. But, <clears throat> With Battle Cry, that was just the breakthrough film for me. And uh, the scene where I took off my shirt was after I'd been to the USO with a married woman and I'd uh, had a little too much to drink and I went for a swim at her house and she was a married woman and the Marine Corps did not like that at all. Some of the literature, some of the letters flying back from the Marine Corps to the studio were quite funny. <laughs> Leon Uris wrote Battle Cry. It was his first novel, I believe, and he did a magnificent job. And uh, it was just such a great opportunity uh, to be a, a part of that film at that time. And can you tell me about working with the director, and I can never say his first name, Raoul Walsh? <laughs> Raoul Walsh <clears throat> directed the film. He's an old-timer, patch over the eye, old blood and guts Raoul Walsh, they called him. And he was tough. He was a wonderful director for action. But when it came to romantic scenes or things that took a little time or a little subtleties, he was impatient. And I'll never forget, I'd had the affair with a married woman and I was calling my wife, I mean my wife, my girlfriend, to say uh, how I had not, you know, how forgive me for not being in touch with you and all that. And it was a touching scene. And right in the middle of the telephone conversation, Raoul's rolling a cigarette and he's saying, all right, hang up the phone, sit back and think of the old broad. And it's right in the middle of the scene. And I said, Raoul, you're making, you're doing this like it's a silent film. You know? <laughs> Please don't interrupt. Let me continue through and then we can do it, you know. He was great. I liked him. He was a great guy. Well, he also embellished stories a lot about like how he lost his eye. Did he ever tell you about his eye and how he lost it? I heard that Raoul was driving a car cross country and a rabbit hit the windshield or hit the window or something. That's how Raoul lost his eye, is what I heard. I don't know how true that is. We didn't talk much about that. Raoul had a monumental job at hand. I mean, that was a big picture and it cost the studio a lot of money and it made them a lot of money. And also, we were going to talk, mention, um, well, I told you LQ Jones is coming. Um, do, do you remember um, working with him, what he was like on the set? L.Q. Jones and I didn't have many scenes together, but he was kind of very easygoing, and uh, he was so natural that he, that's why I'm sure Raoul hired him for that role. Uh, he was very good in that film. Uh, you'd have thought he was an actor, but he's not. I mean, he's just so natural. I mean, you, I don't mean you would have thought him as an actor, but he was just like a person you just picked off the street and put in the film. He was just so good. So good. Yeah, the whole... The whole cast of Battle Cry, we were one unit working and living down in Vieques on the island where we were shooting with the Marines who were doing maneuvers down there at the time. Can and tell me about, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Um, am, I, am I interrupting? Did I no, 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 no. Oh, Van Heflin. This was the first film you made with him. We talked about him a little bit. <laughs> Van, <clears throat> excuse me. Battle Cry was the first time I worked with Van Heflin. And, uh, I was really impressed with him because I knew what a fine actor he was from the theater and as well as, you know, remember him the Philadelphia story and just go on from there. So I watched those actors like a hawk, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh God, I drew a blank. Jim Whitmore. Oh, yeah. Van Heflin, Jim Whitmore. You know, I mean, those are wonderful actors. I love to watch them. I think you can learn an awful lot by standing by the camera and watching people. It's really important to see how they work, how their wheels turn, what makes them do this, what makes them do that. I was very impressed with Van because he's not in your face as an actor. He just is the character and was the character. The three actors that I really loved working with and respected the most were Gary Cooper, Van Heflin, and Fred Astaire. Those three, and I love their reality as human beings, where they came from, uh, they were just incredible. They were simple, 
lovable people re and major talents, major talents. The actress that impressed me the most working with was Geraldine Page. I did uh, a television show with her called Portrait of a Murderer and uh, was nominated for an Emmy on that show. And Jerry was the most flexible actress I've ever seen. She was just able to just reach out here and there. And she was also a very lovely human being. <laughs> and you worked with Gary Cooper, yeah, um, kind of toward the end of his, when he was ill. Is that right? He was sort of at the, um, it was one of his last films that you made with him. Did, you know, was that difficult for you to see that, or did you? I worked with Coop in uh, They Came to Cordura, which was a Bill Getz film for Columbia. It was a wonderful cast. Uh, Gary Cooper, Rita Hayworth, Van Heflin. Um, I never noticed that uh, Coop was uh, ill. I did notice he was a little, he had aches and pains, and now at my age I feel aches and pains, so I could relate to that. But he was, he was a, he had a great presence about him, and Robert Rawson directed it, who, his next film after that was The Hustler with Paul Newman. But uh, Coop, was this, was a real outdoors man, he, and I. I got to know his daughter Maria quite well, and used to take Maria out a lot. She was a fabulous woman, uh, but he was an incredible man. I mean, he was not a he was a movie star, but he wasn't a movie star in your face. He was just a very honest, straightforward human being, and that's what I felt about Fred and Van. As far as um, <clears throat> actors that had the best influence on me, I, I mentioned them. And as far as directors that had the biggest influence on me, I would say Sidney Lumet, Lucchino Visconti, William Wellman. Those are the three. Oh, and I loved Phil Carlson, who was a, I mean, absolutely wonderful director who never got the recognition he should have had either. I like Bill Wellman. Bill Wellman was, was I loved him. Wild Bill Wellman. Just a great guy. Um, he was right out there. Uh, I'll never forget a wonderful story. We came back from location in Santa Maria, and Wellman always had a guy making coffee on the set for everyone there. And Warner at the time decided to be very uh, cost conscious. I can't have free coffee going out. I'm going to put on a machine where everybody has to put their money in the machine. Wellman walked on the set and saw this machine. He said, Wild Bill let loose and was really wild. Open that soundstage door. He took the coffee machine, rolled it down the ramp. It spilled out in the middle of the road. He said, I'm not having my crew spend a dime for a cup of coffee. And the next day, we had, in fact, that afternoon, we had the guy back brewing coffee for us again the way Wellman wanted it. He was a great guy. I liked him. I liked him a lot. And the interesting thing in that film, um, Track of the Cat, there were quite a few... Uh, uh, Wonderful actors in that show. I really enjoyed that. And I worked with a magnificent French actress by the name of Chica Chiro. I'm going to go back to um, William Wellman and ask you, what was he like as a director to you as an actor? What kind of direction did he give you? Was he hands-off? Was he hands-on? Bill Wellman was, a, was, a, was an actor's director. He was very good. He, uh, there are a few directors that really you can communicate with and they look you in the eye and you have your moments where you really know what they want. You can read them. A lot of them are traffic cops. You know, drrr, drrr, that's nonsense. I want to be able to work with someone where you can really relate. And uh, if you come in prepared, then they say, yes, but let's add this. It's like cooking, you know, <laughs> you know, adding this ingredient and that ingredient. Sometimes you had too many ingredients, you better go back to the drawing board and uh, eliminate some of those things. But I think that's what it's all about and relating to the people you work with. Well, what I thought was great about the film too is the way it was, the visually, how it was shot in color film, but he had everybody wearing black and white. It was in, except for Robert Mitchell with the big red, red poncho on. Can you talk a little bit about the style of the film? Wellman had a great style. It was based on a Walter Van Tilburg Clark uh, novel. And um, Track of the Cat was, I think it was very, uh, Wellman was really out there. He always, he was, not, he, was a, he was not afraid to try things. He wanted the starkness of black and white so he could see his actors' faces and eyes. And uh, 
I don't think the picture really worked as well as it could have. Maybe that was in the editing, I don't know, but I think it's an interesting film. Anything that Wellman ever did is interesting, whether it be The High and the Mighty or what, I mean, I don't know, Oxbow Incident. I mean, some great, great films. And Sidney Lumet was a great director, and he always said, you have to, we have to be risk people. If you're playing it safe, stay in bed all day long. It's the safest and the most dull thing to do. So you have to risk. And a lot of people are afraid to put themselves on the line. And that's when a good, act, or that's when a good director comes in and says, like a conductor of a symphony. As far as actor, do you think Robert Mitchum was like that? Was he a risk taker? <laughs> Bob Mitchum was Bob Mitchum. He was so darn natural. I mean, he'd come on the set and say, what picture are we shooting today? And he'd pick up the script and go, Drrr, and he was like a, he could, I mean, instant, he knew the script. He could just, you know, he could just look at something and he'd memorize it like in a flash. Whereas I had to work and work and work and work. I loved his, uh, his nonchalance about the whole thing. Uh, Mitch was pretty out there. I liked him very much. Well, you just reminded me of something when you, when you were just talking about that, is how do you prepare for a role? You know, how, what did you do when you got you know, assigned a project? What were some of the things that you did to get into character? What I did for a role depended on the role. Uh, the role called for me to uh, know how, uh, what it was like to have gone through a mental institution. I would find that out if it called for my knowing how to do certain things or relate to certain situations, I would find that out. I made a lot of notes on things, a lot of notes. And also I use art. I used to use a lot of, a lot of classic paintings. For example, when I did the play with Tulula Bankhead, I used the Botticelli painting of the rebirth of Venus. That was major, it was in the front of my script because it told the whole it told the whole story, what Tennessee Williams wanted to say. So you're very visual. Acting is a visual art. <clears throat> That's what it's all about. I mean, it's all nice to keep it all inside, but it's got to project. So, yes, I'm uh, very visual because that's what it is. It's called moving pictures. <laughs> I love that. I love moving pictures. I guess films nowadays. <laughs> And tell me a little bit about Tallulah Bankhead. And now she was someone I don't think you liked as much as the other actors and actors you've worked with. Tallulah Bankhead and I did a play called The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore, the Tennessee Williams play. Uh, Tony Richardson directed it. And I thought that she was a sad lady. When God has given you a major gift, a major talent like that, I don't think you have a right to dissipate it. And I felt that she had dissipated a lot of her major talent. For example, on stage during the play, she played to her audience. And what you do is you, when you particularly, if you have Tennessee Williams, but in anything, you play the play and people are drawn into that. You don't play to them. And Tennessee uh, was, Geraldine Page said to me, just remember this, if they don't get your message, that's their bad taste. And that's very important. I worked with John Wayne on the sea chase, uh, Duke, <laughs> as everyone called him. Um, and he was very nice when I first met him. He gave me his coat and said, wear this for good luck and all of that. But he was just kind of, I, I don't know, I just couldn't get, a, I couldn't get a reading on him as a person too much. Um, I maybe was, I, I, I just was not comfortable around him. Uh, he did mention one thing to me at one time. He said, um, I wish we had you under contract to Wayne Fellows, which was his company. Um, but he was um, kind of conducting the orchestra, you know, leading the band. And... Uh, he just didn't seem as vulnerable as, uh, as, as a lot of the other, you know, leading men I worked with later. And the next person I want to talk to you about is, is we were mentioning is Natalie Wood. And you did two films with her. Can you talk a little bit about your experience on the set working with her? And I also read you dated her, and her mother liked you the best of all the, all the people she dated, which I thought was fun. Natalie Wood 
<clears throat> was an amazing young lady. I knew her at that stage of her life when she was a little girl and a young woman. It was like a cult finding its legs. One moment she'd be this little girl that just made you smile. And the next moment she'd be very sophisticated and so forth, which would make you smile also because she hadn't found it yet. She had just finished doing Rebel Without a Cause with Jimmy and uh, we did the Burning Hills because of our popularity. So uh, that was the first thing, a Western based on a Louis L'Amour novel. Uh, I did two films with Natalie, turned down two films with Natalie, put on suspension. Uh, but I always liked Nat, Nat. We got along really, really well. She was never a love interest. I just had fun with her. She was a kid. I was a lot older than Natalie. She was a kid. And uh, great fun. What was she like as an actress when you worked with her? What were some of the things, you know, maybe how did she prepare for a role? Or what, was, she, was she as natural as you were talking about the other people, the other actors you were with? Can, can you talk to me a little bit about her as an actress? I remember Natalie first as a child in films like, <clears throat> you know, Miracle of 34th Street and so forth. And then she did Rebel. I think she really started focusing on acting, I mean, seriously, organically, working with people like, you know, Nick Ray as director and Jimmy. And then, um, so she was searching, as was I. And we were working to get the best out of our characters, out of our roles, out of our you know, portrayals. And um, we only really had one argument ever on a set, and that was when we were doing The Girl He Left Behind, which we both referred to as The Girl with the Left Behind. <laughs> it was a David Butler film. Um, we only had one argument on a scene um, but I could see where she was going and where she was headed with her career, which was wonderful. And she had a mother that, uh, that, that, that led her in that direction, too. I liked her mother. We got along well. There's a lot that's been said about her that's not the best, but uh, we had a good rapport. And Natalie, of course, was all over the place, finding her legs. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the argument, or, or you don't? We were doing a, Natalie and I had an argument when we were doing The Girl Left Behind. She was lying, uh, we, we had this l sort of love scene, or the scene where we got disagreed with each other on the beach. And it was actually a process shot uh, at the studio where they did the old process shots, you know. And she's lying there and she got very upset with me and she just, her line was, I want to see some signs of your growing up. So she just yelled that out at me and I just looked at her and I said, well, thank you, Rod Steiger. And she got up and she walked off the set. That's the only argument we ever had because we really got along well. You know, we really got along well. In fact, when we were doing the Burning Hills, she was going to the, we were going to the Academy Awards and she was all excited about going. And um, as we came in that night, I was walking past the hairdressing and makeup room at the studio and she said, oh, I look so terrible. I've been through this Mexican outfit all day long and my hair's all over the place and blah, 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 and I've got to look good. What will I do? And I just happened to hear it and I'd been in France and I said, all the great young gals over there just cut all their hair off and it looks fabulous. Cut it all off. She cut it all off and she's had a trend all over the United States. She made covers of magazines and everything with all this short hair. And um, Sarita Montiel came by the dressing room and said, oh, plumas locas, the <laughs> crazy feathers. So that's what it was called. <laughs> She was a wonderful kid. She really was. She was a kid at that time. That's a great story. And why did you turn down two films with Natalie Wood? <clears throat> I turned down two films with Natalie Wood because <clears throat> I didn't know Natalie was even up for them at the time. One of them I did. But uh, I just didn't like the scripts. I really wanted to do better material, and Warners didn't know what to do with Natalie and myself. We were only a, there were only a few of us under contract. It was the end of the studio era. They did not know what to do with us. So I turned down Bombers B-52 and uh, another film that uh, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. did. Um, but I just didn't think they were right. I wanted to take a step forward in my development. Are there any roles that you turned down that now you wish you didn't turn down? <laughs> Are there any roles I've turned down that I wish I didn't? Yes, big time. <laughs> When I was doing They Came to Cordura with Robert Rawson, he said, I have a wonderful project that I'm doing next. It's about a guy who's a pool shark. And I said, I don't like pool. <laughs> <laughs>
That was the hustler. <laughs> and I'm glad Paul did it because Paul was brilliant. He was brilliant, and it, as in everything. Warner Brothers bought two projects, the two big George Abbott uh, musicals, Pajama Game for Doris Day and Damn Yankees for Me. So uh, I had just finished a big television show in the East and had to fly out immediately because George Abbott wanted me to read with all of the, you know, do a reading of the script with the New York cast who had done, you know, the Broadway cast of Damn Yankees. So we had a meeting and um, I couldn't understand why the whole cast was there. They'd done it uh, hundreds of times and they were all brilliant. So he, he stopped me throughout the, the reading two or three times, started giving me line readings. So I said, whoa. So I said, if you want me to play it like the character did it on Broadway, I think he had a magnificent voice, but I thought he was a real stick. So if I play the character, first of all, he's got to be a human being. So he fired me on the spot. And Jack Warner said, no, 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 you don't fire Tab Hunter. I bought this project for Tab Hunter. We're going to kiss and make up. So I worked with George Abbott, and I thought he was all right. He was very kind of stiff and very... That's why he had Stanley Donnan there to shoot the film. Stanley had a great reputation as a director, and I think he was just there to give George support and to say, this will work, that won't work, this will work, that won't work. Abbott knew what he wanted, but it was very kind of cut and dried and very... You know, Formula A is only Formula A. And I think there's a lot of variations, a lot of colors in life, and I think that's kind of important. So we didn't really get along that well. But the cast was brilliant. The cast of Damn Yankees, they were brilliant. And I loved every one of them. You talk about Gwen Burton. And I, was, I have two questions actually for that. If you can talk about her. And also, you know, I was telling Alan the scene that I love is, of course, when she sings whenever Lola wants. <laughs> and she's dancing all around. You're taking off her clothes. And you, you're, you're just sitting there. Can you talk about shooting that scene? In Damn Yankees, the scene that Lola does, that, uh, that Gwen does, whatever Lola wants, it was a wonderful, it was a very easy scene to do. I just sat there and reacted to what was happening and what she was doing. I mean, she's pretty fabulous. That's a fun film. It's a wonderful film. Worked with incredible people like Bobby Fosse and Gwen. I saw Gwen when I was a teenager at Ciro's and she was a dancer with the Jack Cole dancers. So it was a thrill to work with her and to know her, that wonderful piece of it. And work with Gene Stapleton and people like that. I mean, Ray Walston. I mean, I was very fortunate. I love that. Bobby Fosse. I mean, we're talking major talent here. And every time I get a little upset with George Abbott, Gwen or, or, or Gene would take my hand and say, never mind, it'll work out. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> they were so supportive. They were really good. Did you watch any of the big dance numbers that Bob Fosse choreographed? Were you there to watch it, to watch him in action? Oh, Bobby was on the set a lot. Bobby Fosse was on the set of Damn Yankees. And I have one little moment where I dance a couple steps, and I said, Bobby, I've got two left feet. And I've always wanted to dance. I love musicals. I love to sing. I used to sing in a choir as a kid. He said, come on, Tab. And we, he showed me a couple little things, and uh, it seemed to work out all right. I loved it. But he was a major talent. Married to Gwen Burton at the time, right? And married to Gwen, absolutely. Yeah. So if you can talk about your singing career before Damn Yankees and about the Warner Brothers starting their own record label. Warner Brothers bought Damn Yankees for me as sort of a kiss and make up um, thing because I had been on suspension again with the studio. I think the only other person that probably had more suspensions of Warner Brothers was probably Betty Davis. But uh, he bought the project and... Um, I had recorded, um, I had recorded Young Love for Dot Records, and Warner hit the ceiling when he found it became number one song in the nation. Stayed there for 12 weeks, sold you know a million and a half copies. Uh, they went on and did an album, which Warner's then wouldn't let me release because they had me under contract for under contract for everything. I had had a number of suspensions uh, with Warner Brothers, and sort of the kiss and makeup gift was. Uh, Damn Yankees, which was a very nice gift. Um, so uh, I was really excited about doing a musical. I had cut Young Love for Dot Records, but my Warner Brothers contract said I could not record or do this. The Warners owned me for everything. They were furious, but particularly when the record went to the number one song in the nation, remained there for 12 weeks, sold a million and a half copies, went on and on and on. We did an album that Warners then said, you cannot release. 
uh, we're going to record you. So they started Warner Brothers Records, and uh, that's how I was one of the first recording artists there. But uh, Dan Yankees was uh, um, my little present from Jack Warner. There were great things about Warner. He was, you know, there are things you hated about him and the things you loved about him. He had a, a corny sense of humor. And uh, he did write in his book, uh, I, re I haven't read the book, but he, uh, I was told that I, I, I bought my contract out. And he said, Tab Hunter came up to me on the lot and got down on his hands and knees and begged for his release. So I gave him his release. It cost him $100,000. Well, in those days, that was a hell of a lot of money. It's a lot of money today, too. Uh, and I said, no, I never got down on my knees to Jack Warner. I only get down on my knees to pray <laughs> or to work in the yard. <laughs> How long were you with Warner Brothers? How long were you on contract with them? I was under contract with Warner Brothers from 54 to 59. The next film I would talk about is That Kind of Woman with Sophia Loren, beautiful Sophia Loren. Can you talk a little bit about that film and also working with her? Warner's, Warner Brothers weren't doing a lot of films, so they were loaning me out a lot to Harry Cohn or Columbia or to Paramount. And Sidney Lumet, I had worked for Sidney Lumet on uh, Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates. And Sidney thought I might be right for the film with Sophia Loren called That Kind of Woman. So I had to meet with Carlo Ponti and Sophia, of course, Immediately, I rushed over to Paramount to meet them, and uh, I was fascinated. <laughs> she was an incredible woman. She is an incredible woman. The great thing about Sophie is that under all that fire and sex, she's childlike. That vulnerable quality that is so magnificent. They agreed and said, okay, he'll be fine for the film. So I went to New York, and we shot that kind of woman in the summer. It was hotter than hell. But thank God, Sophia had a big black limousine that was air-conditioned, and we would listen to rock and roll music all day long. And our song was Bobby Darren singing Splish Splash, I'm Taking a Bath. <laughs> it was a fun film. I loved working for Sidney, who was so concentrated and so there. Sidney Lumet came from live television, and Sidney Lumet had been an actor as a child. I believe your best directors have been actors. Sidney was amazing. I'm going to go a little deeper on that and talk a little bit about, you say he's amazing. Why? Sidney Lumet's the kind of director that if he said, now you lay down there and the truck rolls right over your body, you just say, well, where do you want me to position my body so that the truck can roll over me? I mean, that's how much confidence you have in him as a director. He's like Luchino Visconti. And also, when he does something, there's a great energy and intensity, but it's all quiet. It's never out there in your face. It's one-on-one -on -one when you're really getting into things, and that's very important. Did you ever feel intimidated by any of the actors that you worked with? You talked about Sophia Loren and just her presence or Lana Turner. Is there anyone that you just felt intimidated by? Not really, because once you be... I, I, I didn't really feel intimidated by a lot of actors and actresses. I would be intimidated by production because they would say, come on, hurry, 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 and didn't give you the time to really... get it all put together properly. That was intimidating. The actors and actresses were not intimidating because when you're playing a role, you have an object, you have an objective in that scene, and that's what's the focus, and that's what, so that's not important. It's who you're working with, and I don't think of them as, you know, Sophia Loren or Geraldine Page. I think of them as that character. So I don't get intimidated by that. There were, a few, there were maybe a few actors and actresses that might have tried to intimidate or intimidated me. Lily Palmer I was not comfortable with. I felt she was cold. She was a fine actress, but we just did not have a... You know, and that happens in life. You just don't meet everybody, you get along, blah, blah, this is my best new friend. That doesn't happen. Uh, we just did not have a, a closeness. Because I thought she was so beautiful, and she sort of reminded me of Leslie Crown, a tiny bit. Just the way she looked, maybe it's just, you know, because she's from, is she from, is she um, from Paris? I can't remember. She's German. Oh, she's German. So am I. We both have oh, hard heads. Oh, <laughs> oh I didn't that. <laughs> so when I watched that film, I was like, wow, she's so beautiful, I thought. Um, 
Tom Rita Hayward was another woman you worked with who was, you know, again, I mean, God, you worked with those beautiful women in Hollywood. Can you talk about Rita? I love Rita Hayworth. I, I was working with Rita on They Came to Cordura uh, later in life when she was having a little drinking problems. And, oh, God, she was so beautiful. I mean, just all I, I kept looking at her, I kept thinking, oh, remember her in Gilda, remember her in Cover Girl, you know, Lady from Shanghai. I mean, all of them. She was just an amazing woman. I liked Rita very much. I felt she was very shy. And isn't that funny, but a lot of these really sexy women that are really these sex pots, they have a shyness about them. But I just want to put my arms around them. It's very dear. I don't know about Rita's mental problems, you know, with the Alzheimer's uh, when we were doing Cordura. But uh, I was thrilled to hear that later in life her daughter Yasmin took such great care of her. She used to ride horses at the barn, and we used to call her Jazzy Yazzy because she was a go-getter. She was a good little rider. <laughs> Fred Astaire is one of the most incredible people. First of all, he's a true gentleman and a style. That's a word that's really kind of lacking today in so many things, whether it be, you know, it, just in everything. Just apply the word style. Style seems to have gone out the window. Fred Astaire had style. A beautiful human being. We used to talk horses. He used to have race horses. <clears throat> so we talked about horses a great deal. And I'll never forget one scene. We were in San Francisco shooting at the Spreckles mansion up there. And he had this scene, and uh, I was beside the camera get feeding him line, feeding my lines to him. And the director said, Cut. And he said to me, Was that all right, Dad? And I thought, you are asking me if that's all right. No, no, you, there's, there's something wrong here. <laughs> he was just a lovely person. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, Debbie Reynolds and, uh, and, 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 uh, and Fred got along really well because she's off the wall anyway. I've known Deb since she was just starting out. Uh, it was a good experience. Uh, Lily Palmer is a fine actress and she was very good as the, as the mother. I'm going to go back to Debbie Reynolds a little bit and just talk about even Fred Astaire, are there any scenes that you remember shooting? I know you would tell me about Fred, you know, telling you, did I do okay? But are there any other, like, kind of behind-the-scenes stories that you could tell me, even with Debbie, you know, any funny things about shooting the film that you remember? Debbie Reynolds and I <clears throat> knew each other <clears throat> when she was just, when she first went to MGM, she had just done that film that she sang Abbott Abba Honeymoon in. And uh, I knew Debbie then, and she was a, a wide-eyed kid. It was a hell of a lot of fun. I mean, we went out a lot. And I was just starting out. And uh, later, this you know, here we were both had done quite a few films, and we worked together for the first time. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, Debbie is pretty out there. I mean, she calls a spade a spade. She's right there. Um, she was always joking, but very serious about her work. Very serious about her work. And a total contrast to, uh, to a lot of the young women in the business. I mean, very focused. And Fred, uh, they were good contrast, father and daughter. They were a good contrast. I played a rancher and, um, who just was kind of by the rule book. A little, you know, dare to be dull. <laughs> that was my character. One of the names that you brought up earlier that I want to bring up now, who I love, and I luckily got to meet him, is Rod Steiger. And you worked with him in uh, The Loved One. And he was uh, Mr. Joy Boy. And I've, and I've watched that movie, and I love, I mean, he is so over the top. He's so, you know, like you said, loud and, and energetic. Can you talk a little bit about that film, and about working with this Rod Steiger? The Loved One was an Evelyn Waugh novel that uh, Tony Richardson directed as a film, and it uh, was made into a film, Tony directed it, and uh, Rod Steiger <clears throat> was in that, playing Joy Boy. <laughs> he always gave 100%. Always gave one. I mean, and no matter whether it be comedy, whether it be drama, I mean, he was brilliant. He really was. Pawnbroker, who could ever forget that? But, um, 
as, as crazy as he was, you had Liberace playing a, a coffin salesman. Or, I mean, you had just these weird things that happened in the film. Uh, I've always been a fan of Rod Steiger's. I like his work very much because he's, he's a dedicated actor. He was a dedicated actor. Tony Richardson was a good director. He, was, he also directed the play, play that I did with Tulu Levankin on Broadway called The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore. But um, as a director, I thought he was really good. I didn't always like his choices that he wanted for me as an actor. Uh, in the movie, uh, The Loved One, he was fine. On the play on Broadway, I didn't like what he gave me to do at the end of the play because I didn't feel it was what Tennessee had in mind when he wrote it. And I felt that he was a cop-out. But I do respect his talent. And who can ever forget uh, Tom Jones and some of the stuff like that that Tony did. Loneliness, what is it, Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner? Was that another one, I believe? I'm not sure of that. Um, the other film I want to talk about real quick, I don't want to leave out, is The Life and Times of Judge Roy B. And you worked with one, or one director you haven't talked about, John Houston. Mm -hmm. And if you could talk to me about him, and I've, I've read, you know, he's tough. I heard he's a tough guy. If you could talk about working with him and what your experiences were like with him. I, I did The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean um, with Paul Newman, uh, directed by John Houston. And um, I'd heard stories that John Houston was tough. I liked him very much. He had a great twinkle in his eye. And he was, um, he was easygoing, I found him. I came with a prepared, what I thought the character should be like, and all he did was sit beside the camera and go, yes, Dad, yes, that's fine, that's okay. And I kept thinking, are you sure? Don't, isn't there something else you want to add to this? Or, and so he was wonderful. And off camera, we spent a great deal of time talking, what else? Horses. John was the master of hounds of the Galway Blazers in Ireland place I always wanted to go. I always wanted to go fox hunting in, in, in England. I did a great deal of it here in this country. But So we talked horses a lot. I mean, um, I love that. And, you know, anything to get away from the business. <laughs> the character that I played in Judge Roy Bean was a, a horse thief and a, and a, and a, and a crook, and he needed, it was going to be hung. And I just chose to play him as a really kind of the kind of ca character that just had a little dif difficulty getting things out. And I thought it was great fun to do that, you know, and uh, <laughs> it worked for the film. It totally worked. And also I thought it was interesting the style that John Houston picked where you turn to the camera and you talk directly to the camera. Do you remember doing that? Do you remember that style? Instead of talking to the characters, like once you're riding on your horse and you look at the camera and you talk. I think John Houston had, uh, uh, I love creative directors that will uh, either throw out something totally different that you don't expect that you can use or will allow you to bring in things that are not written on the page. Uh, I find that really exciting to work with people like that. John Huston was out there like that. Sidney Lamette was like that. Visconti was like that. The best directors are like that. And Ava Gardner was in this film. I know you didn't have any scenes with her, but did you get a chance to meet her at all? Ava Gardner was in the film, and unfortunately, I never met her. <laughs> She's probably the only beautiful woman you didn't meet. You met else. Well, one of the most beautiful women you worked with, I don't know if you... Divine! I, I love this quote, because, you know, this is such a term of classic movies thing, is you compared yourself, and you said, um, you're the Powell and the um, Loy of the 80s, William Powell and Myrna Loy. Can you talk a little bit about the pairing of you and what made it work? And also, I'm going to jump on more and say Jonathan John Waters. Well, I worked for John Waters in Polyester with Divine. And everyone said, oh, you can't do a John Waters film. It's terrible. I, I, I. It was a wonderful role. And John Waters is so out there. He's terrific. And Divine is a 300-pound beached whale. I mean, my gosh. He's this lovely, soft-spoken gentleman. And then when he gets into his drag, zing, sparks come out. And he's unbelievable. And he was great in polyester. And when Alan and I, when Alan Glasser, my partner and I, um, produced Lust in the Dust, it had to be divine. 
And it had to be Lainey Kazan playing Divine's half-sister. Perfect. And Divine is so professional and wanted more than anything just to be on the money all the time. I mean, he really worked hard. He Everything he did was really good. I always say my favorite leading ladies, Geraldine Page, Divine, Natalie Wood. You know, I just throw his name right in there with him, too, because he was so incredible. He was really good. And we spoofed Westerns with that one. We just did a big spoof. In fact, getting Cesar Romero to be in the film, you know, uh, it was just wonderful. Caesar was such a great guy. I said, Caesar, how would you like to play a priest in our film? <laughs> but he's a little wacko. He said, Dad, I'd love it. You know, he just, you know, these old timers, they were, they were the best. The best. The backbone of the industry. The backbone of the industry. How do you think the industry has changed since the time you first started to now? What are some of the changes you see? Da-da-da. It's, it's just... I don't know. I just I go to movies. I, I I I see them. I vote for them as an Academy member. Uh, I don't have the feeling about motion pictures because I do about independent films because I really like where they're coming from. I think that's important. I think the studio system today there is no studio system. Studios today are dinosaurs. They're major corporations, and they just you don't have the touch, the one-on-one -on -one touch that's lost. And pictures are made, they made, they play down to a lot of people. I don't think that's necessary. I think you make what you believe in, and that's what happens. I feel that a lot of young people today only think about the commerciality of it, but they don't think about the art. I mean, there's a, there's a happy marriage there somewhere but you've got to believe in it and you've got to do it.